Hey, honey, I whispered, nudging Sophia gently. Are you still awake? She murmured something incomprehensible, barely stirring. Can I ask you something? I ventured. How is it that after nearly 23 years together, you've suddenly become so much better in bed? Sophie grumbled, still half asleep. I've always done it for you, she muttered, her voice heavy with sleep. I studied her relaxed form, curled up with an extra pillow, facing away from me. Yeah, you have, I acknowledged, but you never seem to enjoy it. What's with the sudden change? Turning over to face me, Sophia flashed a playful smile with her beautiful blue eyes. Well, she teased, I didn't hear any complaints from you. Returning her smile, I regarded Sophia, my closest friend and the woman I'd admired since we first met over 22 years ago at a backyard party. I'm not complaining, I assured her. I'm just curious. Why the sudden shift? After letting me do it in your mouth twice before we got married, and then never allowing it again. And now, twice in one week after all these years. Sophia, fully awake now, sat up in bed, concerned furrowing her brow. What's bothering you, Dexter? She asked softly. I'm just asking a simple question, Sophia, I explained. For 23 years, you've done this without much enthusiasm. It's always felt like a chore. And tonight, it was different. I'm just wondering where this sudden enthusiasm is coming from. Sophia rose from the bed, hands on her hips, staring at me. If you prefer, we can revert to the old way, she stated, her tone laced with anger. I sense her frustration escalating. No, oh, no, I hurriedly interjected, trying to diffuse attention. I'm genuinely enjoying your improved skills, I reassured her, unable to resist adding a barb. You're almost as good as some of my old college girlfriends. Her face flushed crimson with rage, but before she could retort, I pressed on. But you still haven't explained why your skills have suddenly improved. Did you read something? Talk to your friends? Or maybe you've had some practice. What are you accusing me of? Sophia snapped, her fury palpable. I remained composed. I'm not accusing you of anything, I clarified. I just want to understand. You've always seemed to dislike it throughout our relationship, and suddenly it's become enjoyable. Curiosity peaked. I watched as Sophia grabbed her pillow and stormed towards the door. With anger in her voice, she yelled back. You don't need to think about it anymore, because I won't do it again. She disappeared down the hallway, heading towards the guest room. As she retreated, I called after her. I guess I'll find out the truth tomorrow. Confused, she shot back. What do you mean by that? Taking a deliberate pause, I replied. I mean, the private investigator I hired almost five weeks ago has finished his report. I'm meeting him in the morning. I have a feeling that your newfound skills will be a big part of that report. With that revelation, I closed and locked the bedroom door, leaving Sophia on the other side, her expressions shifting from shock to knocking, crying, and pleading. Sophia, and I typically rose early, but that morning, I wanted to avoid her. Setting my alarm for 4.10, I swiftly dressed in gym attire and left the house within seven minutes. The workout session lasted an hour and a half, leaving me drained. After a shower, I changed into clothes I had prepared in my car the day before. Arriving at my favorite breakfast spot just before six, conveniently close to my office, I ordered coffee and then checked my phone greeted by a barrage of texts and voicemails from my unfaithful wife. Ignoring them, I texted my boss, suggesting we meet at morning breezes before work. Around 25 minutes later, Abigail, my boss, replied, confirming our meeting time of 7.20. Spotting me as she entered morning breezes, she sat down across from me after grabbing a coffee and a bagel to go. Glancing at me, Abigail remarked, You look terrible. I couldn't help but agree. Yeah, I feel even worse, I admitted. Is something amiss at work? She inquired, concern evident in her voice. Shaking my head, I could see Abigail relax a bit. No, it's personal, I confessed. I suspect Sophia might be cheating on me. She practically admitted it last night. I've hired a private investigator, 
and I'm meeting with him this morning to gather details. I just wanted to give you a heads up that I might be in and out of the office as I deal with this situation. I informed Abigail. She sat quietly for a moment, contemplating her response. Finally, she spoke up. How can I support you unless you have a magic solution? I'm not sure there's much you can do. I'll be taking the next couple of days off, but we'll stay in touch with the office. I'll steer clear of Sophia for now, I added. Explaining my plans, I shrugged. I have a meeting with a private investigator today and a lawyer tomorrow. Abigail raised a skeptical eyebrow. Don't you think you're getting ahead of yourself? Unless there's something you're not telling me, you haven't found any proof yet. I recounted a deliberate confrontation from the previous night. I purposely started a fight about closeness. Sophie got angry right away and stormed out of the bedroom. I told her she didn't have to answer my questions. My private investigator would handle it in the morning. If you had seen the look on Sophia's face, you'd be absolutely certain about what the report will say, I remarked. You should talk to her, Dexter, Abigail suggested. I know I will, but not right now. Concerned about my accommodations, she inquired, where are you going to stay? Offering a solution, she rummaged through her oversized purse and produced a set of keys. Handing one to me, she said, here's a key to our cottage. You've stayed there before. It's only a 33-minute drive. We won't be using it until the end of the month. As I accepted the key, Abigail offered some advice. Can I give you some advice? Of course. If things go the way you expect, your life will get worse before it gets better. It'll be tough for a while. Then, one day you'll wake up and you won't feel completely terrible. You'll just feel miserable. That'll be the beginning of your recovery. It sounds like you're speaking from experience, I remarked, acknowledging Abigail's personal disclosure. My ex-husband divorced me 11 years ago. It was rough. As we sipped our coffee, Abigail continued, opening up in a way she seldom did. I don't talk about it much, mostly because I'm embarrassed. I mess up my life, my kids' lives, and Lucas's life. His family hates me. My son's friends hit on me because they know everything I jumped into. You don't need to share all this with me, Abigail, I interjected gently. I know even after two years of therapy sessions every week, I still have more questions about my stupid actions than answers. We shared a chuckle, but Abigail's expression grew sullen again. Sadly, she resumed, Lucas discovered my cheating in the worst way possible. He tested positive for an STD. I gave my husband and closest friend a disease. I was left speechless, prompting Abigail to continue. It gets worse, if that's even possible. I panicked and blamed Lucas, saying he gave me the disease. We both knew, well, everyone knew I'm the one who cheated. She confessed, her gaze fixed on the table. Why did you do it? I asked, genuinely curious. Abigail hesitated before answering, because I could. Because I wanted to feel attractive again. Because I wanted a secret. Because I enjoyed forbidden, anonymous, rough closeness. She elaborated, her voice tinged with regret. I travel for work, just like you do once or twice a year. I'd meet someone interesting and invite them to my room. Looking back, it seemed so foolish. We sat in silence for a moment until Abigail broke it with a probing question. Have you ever been unfaithful? I shook my head. No, honestly, I've never felt tempted. Don't get me wrong. I'm not perfect. I enjoyed flirting and knowing that women find me attractive. But I've never thought about betraying Sophia. Why do you think that is? It's just who I am, I replied simply. The intimacy with Sophia had always been fairly routine. She wasn't one for exploring new experiences. Yet, even a standard evening with Sophia surpassed the excitement of the wildest one-night stands from my college days. What made you suspicious? Abigail inquired. Sophia and I have always been active in bed. Even after 23 years, we're intimate two or three times a week lately. Sophia's been a bit more forward, a bit more daring, I explained, shrugging offhandedly. After a couple of months with a growing knot in my stomach, I hired a private investigator. I'll find out the results soon. I bet Sophia will call the office looking for you. What should we tell her? 
Abigail asked, concern evident in her voice. Let her know I'm taking some time off and won't be back until next week, I decided. As Abigail settled the bill, she grabbed her bagel and gave me a tight hug. Stay strong. If you need anything, just let me know, she reassured me. Our daughters, Ella and Emma, were both in their third year at the University of Connecticut. Ella, born ten months before Emma, had skipped fourth grade, leading to their graduation from high school together. Ella was following in my footsteps, studying electrical engineering, while Emma pursued chemistry with aspirations for a medical career. I managed to reach Emma earlier, asking her and Ella to meet me later in the day without informing their mom. What's going on? Mom's been calling like crazy, and she must know we're avoiding her. Ella remarked as I hugged her and kissed Emma's cheek, leading them to a quiet spot in the student union. You don't look so good, Dad, Ella observed. I chuckled, realizing those were the same words my boss had said earlier. Yeah, I've heard that before, I replied. Then Emma spoke up, I turned direct, just spill it, Dad. We're concerned. What's happening? I had rehearsed what to say, but when the moment came, I couldn't find the words. Instead, the tears I'd been holding back since meeting with the private investigator burst out. Both girls leaped out of their seats and hugged me tightly, providing comfort until I could compose myself. I hate to break this to you, but I'm going to file for divorce from Mom. She's been having a long-term affair with a co-worker. I confessed. Ella began to speak, but her words trailed off, overcome with emotion. Yeah, sweetheart, I'm sure. I have evidence, I assured her. Ella looked stunned, and Emma started to cry. Then Ella spoke up again. Dad, I need to see the proof. Understanding her need for clarity, I reached for one of the less offensive photos from the investigator's report. Showing them a picture of their mom, and Jacob Patterson leaving a house, their real estate firm was selling. They were kissing on the front porch. As they looked at the picture together, Ella began, Dad. Interrupting her gently, I reassured her, Sweetheart, I have photos, videos, texts, and emails. I won't show you any of it, but I've seen them. And they're terrible, I informed them, noticing both girls now in tears. Are you really going to divorce Mom? Emma asked between sobs. At this point, I don't see any other choice. I know I haven't been a perfect husband or father, I admitted, waving off their objections. But I've always tried to do right by you. Sometimes I messed up, but never on purpose. I've given mine all to this family. I don't have anything left to give, and it seems like Mom wants more. The girls listened intently as I spoke. I still love your Mom, though. Not as much as I did six weeks ago, when I first got suspicious. But I don't like her much anymore. I can't trust her, and I can't imagine ever trusting her again. And the worst part is, she's lost respect for me. She's been belittling and humiliating me in the worst ways, and she doesn't care. There was a brief silence, broken by Ella's ringing phone. We saw Mom on the screen. Don't answer that. I instructed Ella before I could speak further. But Ella grabbed her phone and answered angrily. Sorry, Mom. But we're too busy consoling Dad, she declared firmly. Sophia's hysterical shouts were audible as Ella ended the call. I recounted the tension palpable. When the phone rang again immediately, Ella swiftly turned it off and Katie followed suit. I'm sorry, you're stuck in the middle of this mess. Your Mom. Well, she's still your mom. She loves you. And you know it, I reassured them. As much as things might be tense between you and mom for a while, you still need to treat her with respect. I continued, anticipating their objections. Raising my hand to silence them, I clarified, I'm not asking you to forgive her for what she's done or the damage she's caused, but we all have to find a way to move forward. Glancing at both of them, I added, She's your mom, flaws and all, just like you have to accept me. Leaving the campus, I made a pit stop at a burger joint for some food and a much needed craft beer. Then I headed over to my parents' house. Rarely visiting unannounced, I sat in the driveway, gathering my thoughts. 
I noticed the front door open, and my dad stepped onto the front stoop, followed by Mon. They observed me from a distance as I sat in my car, summoning my courage. I stepped out of the car and made my way toward them. Dad and I met halfway, and he pulled me into a tight bear hug. All the strength I had tried to gather vanished, and I cried into Dad's shoulder without shame. Your mom, and I don't know what's happening, but the frantic calls from Sophia let us know something's wrong. I confessed after explaining Sophia's affair with her co-worker to my parents. Do you think counseling could help you deal with this? Mom asked hopefully, her concern evident. She sees Sophia almost like her own daughter. Dad added. Tears welled up in Mom's eyes as I shook my head and replied, I don't want to see a therapist. I've treated Sophia and the girls like royalty. I didn't do anything wrong. I don't deserve how cruelly Sophia's treated me. But you've had so many good years together, Mom sighed, trying to find a solution. With a heavy heart, I admitted, you're right, Mom. We've had a great life until Sophia, and Sophia alone, wrecked it. This isn't a one-time mistake. It's a full-blown affair between two selfish married people who only care about themselves. Mom seemed to be searching for another solution when I shocked her with my next words. Why would you want me to be miserable? Living with a lying, cheating person. I'm not perfect, but I deserve better than being with someone unfaithful, please. Mom pleaded with me. Dexter, don't use those words to describe Sophia, at least not in front of me. I'm trying to make a point, she insisted. Mama, Sophia's taken everything I have to offer, but it's not enough. She's hurt and disrespected me. Don't I deserve better? I argued, feeling the weight of my emotions. Dad interrupted, urging me to cut Mom some slack. We're still trying to process this shock. You know we'll support whatever decision you make, he added after a pause. And understand, if possible, we'd like to maintain a relationship with Sophia and her family. It might not be as strong as before, but I hope Sophia's actions haven't ruined that possibility, Dad concluded. As Dad finished speaking, Mom's phone rang. She checked the screen and sighed. It's Sophia. After a moment's hesitation, Mom looked me in the eye and declared, I won't ignore Sophia's calls. I won't deceive her. I'll never ask you to do that, Dad. I remained quiet as Mom picked up the phone. Hello, Sophia. He got here about 13 minutes ago and told us about your actions. I think he'll be staying here tonight. Mom relayed calmly. Sophia, I'm sorry, she added softly before hanging up. Dexter, Sophia's coming over. Mom informed me. Don't worry about it. Mom, I'm going to head out, I stated, preparing to leave. I'll give you a call tomorrow, Mom said, as I prepared to leave. Where are you going? she inquired. Abigail has a cottage at Cooper Lake. She's letting me stay there for now, I explained. You'll have to talk to her eventually, Dad pointed out. I will, but I'll do it when I'm ready. Not when she wants, I'm just not prepared yet, I replied firmly. What should we say to Sophia when she shows up? Mom asked. I call her and let her know. It's pointless for her to come over. Tell her I'm not ready to talk. I trust you won't lie, but I hope you won't tell her where I'm staying, I added. Mom started crying, and I walked over to hug her tightly. Dad joined in, and the Arlington family found solace in each other's embrace. My parents silently provided all the emotional support I needed after officially initiating the divorce process with a visit to a highly recommended divorce lawyer. Later, I went to my in-law's house. Sophia's car wasn't there, so I parked and approached the front door. It's really bad, isn't it? Mason Baker, Sophia's father, spoke as he opened the front door. It's about as bad as it gets, I confirmed. Mason stood in the doorway, blocking my way, and asked, Who cheated? Do you have proof? I nodded and Mason exclaimed, Dang, before heading to the kitchen, leaving the door slightly ajar. Sophia's mom, Olivia, was nervously sitting at the kitchen table. She looked up as I entered and gestured toward the coffee maker, saying fresh coffee's there, I recounted. As I silently poured myself a cup, Mason retrieved a bottle of Jack from a cabinet. We both sat down, and Mason poured a generous amount of bourbon into his coffee, 
Sliding the bottle my way, he asked, can I see the evidence? I can show you the written report, but I won't share the photos or videos. I responded firmly as Mason cursed and met his eyes. But Mason, I'm begging you, please don't ask to see the photos. No father should ever have to see his daughter in those situations, I pleaded, feeling the weight of the request. It was painful to witness, but Mason visibly deflated in front of Olivia and me. Olivia interjected, her voice tinged with concern. Is there any chance your marriage can be saved? I met with a lawyer this morning. He'll have the paperwork ready by early next week and will file it with the court. On Wednesday, the lawyer will contact Sophia using her cell number. She can choose to pick up the paperwork at his office, or we can serve her, I explained, remaining resolute in my decision. Officially, I can't believe you're giving up on your marriage so easily. Olivia burst out angrily. I'm not giving up, Olivia. Sophia made that decision when she chose to cheat on me. I counted my turn firm. But it happened just once, Olivia yelled. Taking three deep breaths to calm down, I briefly regretted adding bourbon into my coffee. It wasn't just once, Olivia. Sophia and her affair partner know how many times they've met. It's been going on for months, I clarified, the weight of the truth hanging heavy in the air. We sat in silence for a moment before I continued. This is your second marriage, just like mine. Both of your first marriages ended because of infidelity. Mason interjected quickly, his tone somber. But those marriages were new. You've been married for 23 years. Doesn't that count for something? I continued, searching for understanding. Love, trust and respect, Mason. You've said those words to me countless times. A marriage needs all three. I don't trust Sophia, and she doesn't respect me, I replied honestly. Olivia asked, her concern evident, will you treat Sophia fairly in the divorce? I have to follow the divorce laws, but I won't make it harder on Sophia or our family than necessary, I assured her. What about the girls? Mason inquired, his concern shifting to our daughters. I talked to them yesterday on campus. They know about the divorce and the reason they're upset with Sophia, like everyone else. It might take time, but they'll understand. I promise, I explained, hoping to ease his worries. I hope you don't mind me asking. Feel free to ask anything. I'm divorcing Sophia, not you. And Mason, I hope we can still have a friendship. I expressed, acknowledging the importance of their support during this challenging time. Tears streamed down Olivia's face as she pleaded. Please talk to Sophia. I will, I promise, but not today. And probably not for a few days, but I will talk to her, I assured her. Jessica Green had been friends with Sophia for a long time. They could have been closer, but I've always been cautious of Jessica and her husband George. Since our first meeting, I've known Jessica and George to have an open marriage. While they didn't actively recruit others into their lifestyle, they weren't secretive about it either. Over the years, they often shared stories about their activities. Sophia's interest in swapping parties and casual relationships made me uncomfortable, but I trusted my wife completely. I can't believe how you're treating Sophia. Yes, she messed up big time, but she's sorry. You need to move on and stop acting foolish. If you want to mess around, go ahead. But don't do anything reckless. Jessica began as she sat down across from me. I'm not going to do anything reckless, I promise, I replied firmly. Jessica looked skeptical and continued, Sophia thinks you're planning to get a divorce. I'm getting a divorce. Papers will be filed Wednesday. It's not foolish. It's what people do when they want to leave a cheating spouse, I asserted. Before Jessica could say more, I posed a question. You've known me almost as long as Sophia has. I've known about your open marriage the whole time. Have I ever given any indication I'd be okay with infidelity? Jessica was shocked and muttered. This is a nightmare. It's a nightmare for Sophia, me, our kids, and everyone else. Jessica, it's about to become your nightmare too. I said, feeling anger bubbling within me. Jessica snapped back. Of course, it's a nightmare for George and me. We've been friends for years. I smacked at Jessica, knowing my warning went right over her head. What? she asked, her tone agitated. 
I had a private investigator looking into Sophia's suspicious behavior. I revealed, staying assertive. Jessica retorted, yeah, so what? He caught her cheating. The private detective's report includes all the text messages between you and Sophia for the past six months. I continued. Jessica tried to process this revelation. Then I dropped the bomb. I know Jacob was part of your swapping group. Before you got married, you even told Sophia he has a big Johnson. When you found out he was working with Sophia, you pushed her to go for it. Sophia's kept you updated on their dates. I know every detail. You witch, I declared. Before Jessica could speak, I cut in, every action has consequences. Sophia's cheating leads to divorce. Your consequences won't be as severe, but I'll make sure to mess with your lives. Jessica demanded, how will you do that? With a smile, I answered, Dad, you asked. I reached into my back pocket and withdrew a folded paper, unfolding it as I spoke. I'm going to send this email out to a few people that you and George know. I stated, the subject of the impending message clear. Jessica and George Green have ruined my marriage, friends. I'm Dexter Washington. I've been married to Sophia for almost 23 years. Except for the last few months, our marriage seemed perfect, at least to me, until the direct impact of Jessica and George Green's open marriage. I began, the words heavy with the weight of betrayal. My wife has cheated on me and I'm filing for divorce after 23 years of marriage have gone down the drain. I'm sending this email as a cautionary tale to prevent other marriages from being ruined by Jessica and George's casual attitude toward faithfulness. My wife had an affair with a swapping friend of George and Jessica. Jessica encouraged the affair, telling my wife, Sophia, she'd never forget it. I continued, the bitterness evident in my turn. Jessica was right. My wife will never forget her affair as it's destroyed our marriage and family. Whether you're connected to the Green personally, professionally, or socially, be aware of their complete disregard for marriage vows and their readiness to wreck your own marriage. Maybe if I'd been more careful in choosing our friends, Sophia, and I wouldn't be headed for divorce, I concluded, signing off with my name. Jessica threatened to sue. If you send this to anyone, she warned, her tone filled with menace. I chuckled lightly and replied, my lawyer checked out the email and text messages. He said everything in the email is true. I watched Jessica's expression closely and continued, who are you sending it to? Her eyes widened in shock as I listed. I've got emails for all the teachers and administrators in your school district, plus 47 folks at George's company. There are over 250 people there, but the email will probably spread. Members of your country club and church will see it too, along with some brutes you and George are involved in. Jessica sat there, stunned, as I handed her a copy of the email. You can show George exactly what's going out. Have a great life, you awful person. I added with a hint of finality. As part of the private detective report, I learned about Ella Patterson, married to that jerk Oscar Patterson, who took her kids to the park every Saturday. She and her kids hung out with a regular group of moms and kids. Ella greeted me warmly. Dexter, haven't seen you since the company holiday party. What brings you here? Just wanted to catch up, Ella. I replied casually, though I could feel the weight of the impending conversation. As five moms eyed us curiously. I continued, this isn't a random run-in. Can we chat alone for a bit? Ella agreed, her enthusiasm faltering as she sensed the gravity of the situation. Sure, absolutely, she replied. But soon, her cheerful demeanor shifted as she questioned, Dexter is everything. Her voice trailed off as understanding dawned on her face, and Ella went visibly pale. Her friends, noticing her change in demeanor, looked either concerned for Ella or upset that I had caused her distress. Are you okay? Asked the plump blonde beside her. Ella didn't respond right away, only snapping out of her trance when another mon demanded, What's happening? I'm okay, really, Ella finally replied, but then turned to me and suggested, I think we should talk privately. That would be best. A slim, attractive redhead stood up, shooting angry looks between Ella and me. Dexter, this is my protective cousin, Chloe. Meet Dexter Washington. He's married to someone who works with Jacob. 
I think he wants to chat about the women's intuition stuff. You believe I've been imagining ladies? Ella explained to Chloe, gesturing towards me. How about Ella? And I head to the picnic table under the tree. Chloe suggested offering support to her cousin. We'll have some privacy there, but still be close by. Ella stared at the ground for a moment, tears silently streaming down her face as she rose to her feet. Chloe rushed to her side, embracing her tightly, and as they both cried, Chloe's anger softened to sadness upon seeing my own tears. I'm not just delivering bad news. I'm caught in the middle of this mess with your cousin, I explained to Chloe as we walked alongside Ella towards the picnic table. She halted after a few steps, turned to Chloe, and said, Can you take the kids home with you? Chloe replied, Sure thing, Ella. And if necessary, can they stay over for the weekend? Chloe gave a sad smile and nodded in agreement. Seated across from each other at the picnic table, I inquired, How long have you been aware of this? Ella sighed, Unfortunately, this is a new territory for me. We tied the knot a bit later than most, and soon after we started a family, after our second child, Jacob, got a vasectomy, his first affair cropped up within five months. The second followed a year after our first confrontation. Now this is the third strike. I've had a hunch something was off for about a month. I'm wrestling with the decision to divorce Sophia. I know it's inevitable, but I keep doubting myself. Can you shed some light on why you stayed with Jacob after his first two affairs? I asked. Ella responded, It was mostly for the kids, well entirely for them really. I grew up with divorced parents. A bitter mom and a dad I saw once a week. I didn't want that for my own kids. I still don't, but it seems like that's where we're headed. Fortunately, I have a strong support network nearby, so I'll have plenty of help. I had a feeling Ella would answer that way so I nodded in agreement. Can you tell me why Jacob cheats? I inquired. Ella nodded in response. He enjoys the excitement of corrupting good girls. I was pretty innocent about closeness. Jacob was my lover and teacher. He set rules and rewarded me when I followed them. I liked being his naughty partner, but only in a loving, faithful marriage. Do you have any evidence? Ella asked, handing her a thick envelope. I replied, I suggest giving this to your lawyer and avoiding looking at it. Most of Jacob and Sophia's conversations are hurtful. There's nothing there except pain. What made you suspicious of Sophia? Ella inquired. I chuckled, saying, It seems Jacob has similar expectations for Sophia, like a loyal pup. She learned the tricks and shared them with me. I decided to stay at Chloe's place for the weekend. While we've been talking, I know it's a big ask, but could you drive me home so I can pack for a few days? Before I could respond, Ella warned, Jacob will be there. I'm not worried about your lousy husband. I'm happy to take you home, I assured her. After sorting out everything with Chloe, Ella came back to me, and we headed to my car. The drive to her house was pretty quiet. When we reached her street, she pointed to a sport utility vehicle parked on the side, and told me to stop there. Following her instructions, I parked next to the truck and watched as Ella signaled to the driver. Then she gestured ahead and told me her house was a white colonial, five houses down on the left. As I pulled into the driveway, the sport utility vehicle followed behind me. Jacob was out in the front yard, mowing the lawn. Things unfolded quickly. Jacob waved to Ella as she got out of my car. Two women swiftly exited the sport utility vehicle, flanking Ella and guiding her to the front door. A big man trailed behind the women, standing guard by the entrance. After they went inside, an older man emerged from the sport utility vehicle. Just as I stepped out of my car, he approached me with a handshake and introduced himself. I'm Larry Green. Ella is my daughter. I leaned against the front of my car, hands on the hood, watching as Jacob approached. What's Ella doing with you? Jacob looked shaken, his face pale. I bumped into Ella at the park this morning. I needed to share some important information from my private investigator with her. Before Jacob could say anything, Larry chimed in, calling him scum and telling him he lost the only good part of his sorry life. Jacob erupted in anger, 
yelling that it was all garbage and attempting to rush towards the front door, shouting at someone named Dylan, whom I assumed was the big guy sitting on the steps. Dylan remained unmoved until Jacob tried to pass. Then he swiftly got up, pushed Jacob back, and sent him tumbling to the ground. Larry glanced at me, and I commented, Looks like Jacob slipped. Larry nodded in agreement. Struggling to get up, Jacob turned to me and shouted, blaming everything on my wife. He claimed she came after him, insisting that everyone knew she was just public property. I won't argue with you there, Jacob, I replied. Sophia may be a witch, but she's not my problem anymore. I chuckled sadly, masking my emotions. Larry placed a reassuring hand on my shoulder, offering some encouragement. He remarked that Jacob and I were a match made in hell, knowing each other's game well. I shrugged off the comments, stating that I wanted nothing to do with Sophia. I shook hands with Larry, telling him Jacob wasn't worth my time, and I exited, bidding him to take care of Ella, acknowledging her as a great woman. It had been three weeks since Sophie got served, and negotiations between her lawyer and mine were ongoing. Life felt like a bleak routine. During lunch, I checked my voicemail and heard from my mother-in-law, Olivia. Hey, Dexter, it's Olivia. Just reminding you about the promise you made to talk with Sophia. It'd mean a lot if you could give her a call. Thanks, love you. Grinding my teeth, I reluctantly dialed my home number, knowing Sophia was at work. I left a message, Sophia, it's Dexter. I'm staying at Abigail's family lake house. If you're up for it, swing by on Saturday for lunch. I'll make sandwiches. We can chat. Meet me at the backyard picnic table at noon on Saturday. Thanks for coming out here. Thanks for coming out here, Dexter, Sophia said, sitting across from me at the picnic table by the lake. Even without her usual radiance, Sophia still looked good after all these years. It's nice to see you, I replied. Sophia glanced around and said, It's so serene here. I agree. Initially, I was considering moving into a downtown condo near the office, but lately, I've been eyeing lakefront properties around here, I shared. My unintended comment hit Sophia hard, and I could see the devastation in her eyes right away. Sophia, I'm... I started, but she cut me off with a wave of her hand. Tears welled up as she said, no need to apologize, I'm just being overly sensitive, looking away from the table. Sophia's words hung heavy in the air, as she collected herself. I'm so scared, she continued. I've been scared before many times, work challenges, raising our wonderful daughters. They've all terrified me, but I always had you by my side. We were a team, and I knew together we could tackle anything, she reflected, smiling softly. I agreed. We did a good job, didn't we? I responded, and we shared a peaceful moment, eating our lunch. I topped off Sophia's wine glass and poured myself another beer. I've started seeing a therapist, Sophia sighed. Well, a shrink, to be fair. Dr. Scott has been great, helping me navigate the end of our marriage and find my way forward solo. I'm glad to hear that, Sophia. I hope it helps you find the closure you need, I replied. I've told myself over and over not to ask you about reconciliation. Everyone says it's not possible. But I have to ask, is there any chance you can forgive me? And we can try again. Sophia's voice trembled with hope. I took a deep breath and downed a swig of beer. That's two separate questions, Sophia. I've been wrestling with the forgiveness part since we agreed to meet today. I've made a commitment to myself to try. I admitted. After some thought, I continued, it's going to be a process. And I'm not sure if it's achievable, but I'm going to give it a shot. But let me be clear, if I do forgive you, it's not primarily for your sake, but for the girls, our family and myself, finishing off the rest of my beer. I added, we'll still be in each other's lives enough that I don't want to carry around any bitterness. But Sophia, the divorce will proceed, and we won't be getting back together. Sophia cried and nodded in understanding. She asked, can I reach out if I need support? If I need someone to talk to? Though I wanted to shout, I kept calm, grabbed another beer from the cooler, and filled my glass. Once I composed myself, I proposed, how about a compromise? 
Until the divorce is final, let's handle things through our lawyers. Afterward, I'll be open to your calls, except for emergencies. Seven months later, our divorce was finalized. It was my first night in my new lakeside home, and I sat on the back deck, contemplating whether to crack open a couple of high-alcohol craft beers from the cooler or dive straight into the bourbon on the table before me. When my phone buzzed and I saw Sophia's name, I answered with a smile. Hey Sophia, I'm really down and could use someone to talk to, she said, her voice tinged with sadness. Five years later, things were looking up. One morning, I noticed the sky seemed bluer and the birds sounded cheerier. Life was improving. Abigail was proven right. She moved to our company's main office in Dallas, where she's now the executive vice president of sales and marketing. Despite staying single, she's seen her kids grow up. After a glass or two of wine, she admits to enjoying the occasional thrill of the one-night stand. Ella graduated college with top honors and now works as an engineer for a defense contractor on the West Coast. She's in a somewhat serious relationship and pursuing her master's degree. Part-time, Ella maintains a strong bond with both Sophia and me, chatting with us weekly. We affectionately call Emma the Mole because of her lack of a social life. After college, she worked for a pharmaceutical company for a couple of years before getting into medical school. Engaged to another student, they're both devoted to their studies. While I reach out to Emma weekly, she seldom initiates contact, preferring to focus on her studies. My parents have surprisingly good health for their age, and Olivia is also doing fine despite minor health concerns. They alternate hosting weekly dinners with my parents, maintaining close ties. Jessica and George relocated to the Midwest a year after our divorce. Ella and her kids are thriving, although it took her a while to start dating again. She's been quite popular among eligible suitors, setting high standards. Eventually, she found Mr. Lopez, and they recently celebrated their first anniversary. Judging by their constant smiles, they still feel like newlyweds. Sophia appears to be content as well. While her relationship with Emma remains strained, her other connections have healed. She's been seeing a man for five months, and the last time we spoke, she mentioned he might be the one. I'm hopeful for her happiness. As for me, things are going smoothly. I stepped into Abigail's role as division president after she moved to Dallas. My responsibilities are manageable, and two years post-divorce, I bumped into an old acquaintance, Ella's cousin Chloe. We met at a mutual friend's daughter's graduation party and chatted a bit later as the older crowd left. During lunchtime, like most days, Chloe showed up at my office and locked the door behind her. I quickly ended the call and joined her on the couch. My prowess isn't what it used to be. While I may have been more energetic in the past, now I can only offer a few drops. Sadly, the days of intense passion are behind me. Friends, post a comment how you like this story.